Let's get ready to grumble! All right, and this is Steve with Let's Get Ready to Grumble, and today's guest is going to be someone you probably never talked to or heard of or anything else. His name is Warren Mosler, and he is the father of modern monetary theory, what once was called Mosler Economics, and I was lucky enough, happy to have Warren Mosler be able to join me, not only to talk to you about what MMT is, but to talk about this damn inflation thing. It has me insane watching television, listening to other alternative media personalities describing the stuff. And in fairness, it, 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 they always, literally always get it wrong. So without further ado, let me bring on my guest, Warren Moser. Warren, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, good to be here, Steve. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, you have always been, in my mind anyway, the father of MMT, the OG OG of all OGs. Yeah. And uh, I know that when we first met, you know, this was called Mosler Economics. And uh, your website, the center of the universe, uh, has some great, great uh, resources for anybody that's interested in uh, reading up on MMT. But could you please tell the audience what MMT is modern monetary theory is and and why it matters okay so uh, I'd say the most important thing to understand is that uh, what, what I came up with years ago is the understanding that the dollars that can be used to pay taxes come from the government okay now this is in direct contrast to every member of Congress every economists, everyone else out there who was saying that, uh, well, the members of Congress would say, we have to get money by taxing to be able to spend it. Okay. And if we want to spend more than we tax, we have to go out and borrow money to be able and spend that money. And so any money that we want to spend in Congress here, we have to get it first by uh, either getting it by taxing or get it by borrowing. And sure enough, you saw President Obama with uh, Secretary Clinton going to China in, I think, 2009 to make sure we could borrow money from our creditors, China, who they move our creditors to be able to fund the stimulus package. President Hu and I agreed the link between China's economy and ours is of great mutual benefit. And we established a new strategic and economic dialogue between the United States and China. All right. And what uh, modern monetary theory points out, and it's something that the uh, operations people in the Federal Reserve have always known since the beginning and every other central bank has always known. And that is that these dollars <coughs> that the, uh, the government is spending come from the government. Okay, they don't come from the private sector. They originate in the government. And if the private sector tries to originate dollars to pay taxes, that's called counterfeit and you go to jail for that type of thing. There's strict laws against that. So it makes an enormous difference in how you view things. So, uh, you know, congressmen think they have to go out and look for dollars to be able to spend. The real struggle in the world is that the us, the taxpayers, we are dependent on the government spending to get the dollars that we need to pay the taxes. OK, now this does not mean that the government does not have to tax. OK, it does mean that it spends first and then we get the money and then we pay our taxes. But what the government has to do first is tax and specifically it has to impose tax liabilities, tax obligations. So just to keep the conversation simple, let's imagine the only obligation it does is it puts a tax on everybody's house. Okay, so step one uh, would be the government would uh, put a property tax on everybody's house. This creates a population that now needs dollars to pay taxes. Before the tax, there was no particular need for dollars because, uh, you know, in this economy, let's look at it from day one. Uh, and, and, but now, once there's a tax on everybody's house, there's this massive need uh, for dollars, and it might be three trillion or four trillion dollars tax on everybody's house. Okay, so now people need the dollars, so they'll go to work to earn dollars. They'll sell things to get dollars, people who don't want, okay, and they're trying to get dollars. And now the government can hire them. You can say, okay, I'll, I put a tax on your houses, you all need dollars, 
And so now if you want dollars, come work for me. If you're a soldier, I'll pay you $50,000 a year. If you're a Supreme Court justice, I'll pay you 200,000 and so on down the line. If you're a public school teacher, I'll pay you whatever. Okay, and so <clears throat> the government can then pay people to do all the work that it wants done. And then after that, people can pay their taxes. So what we point out is the sequence. The sequence is first a tax liability by a government that wants to provision itself. The government wants people to, in public service, it wants um, school teachers, it wants soldiers, it wants public health workers, okay? How does it get them? It puts, number one, it puts a tax on your house. Number two, uh, this causes you to now be unemployed and go out looking for paid work, work that pays in dollars. Number three, it hires you. Number four, you get paid. And then number five, you pay the tax. Okay, so the purpose of the taxation was not for the government to get your money. It came from the government. They spend it first. The purpose of the taxation is to get you to need their money so that you will go work for the government. So then they can pay you and then you can pay the tax. And that's the end of the line is when you pay the tax. Once they understand that sequence, you realize that the whole idea of government solvency just doesn't make any sense. It's not applicable. It's not like where is the money going to come from? All right. The money comes from the government. They just credit your account. If you, uh, with online banking, you can just look at your account and you might have thousand dollars in your account, which is a one zero zero zero. And then here comes my social security check. And all of a sudden my account says four zero zero zero. I just got three thousand dollars put into my account by the government. OK, what did they do? Did they take a gold coin and hammer it in? No, all they did was change the one into a four. Okay, yeah, and that little keyboard. Okay, and they changed the number up in my account. That's called crediting an account. Okay. Okay, and but that's all they do. They're the scorekeeper for this dollar. Okay, and so uh, it doesn't come from anywhere. It's, they're not going to run out of it or anything like that any more than the uh, scorekeeper at a football game is going to run out of points if your team kicks a field goal. It's not that kind of a problem. But once you understand that, then you realize the problem isn't where is the money going to come from? It's, is there anything out there for them to buy? Because they need these tax liabilities, these property taxes out there in sufficient quantity to get sufficient things for sale so that their otherwise worthless currency, you know, without taxes, it, mm -hmm. it's not worth anything. Taxes are, the dollar is a tax credit, the thing that pays your taxes. Tax credit's not worth anything without a tax. Okay, so are, are these tax liabilities creating enough things for sale so they can go buy them? And if they're not, the uh, evidence might be they have to, they, that the government starts paying higher prices to buy the same thing. That's evidence that their tax liabilities haven't been strong enough to create enough selling pressure to keep prices going up. Now, there are other reasons prices could go up. One reason, would be that the taxation isn't high enough, it's not strong enough, uh, there's not enough demand for the currency, they haven't spent enough. That's one possible reason. Now, it's it's a theoretical reason, it's certainly a possible reason, but in my, how many years now? 50 years of watching this stuff, <laughs> I've never seen it, okay? That's not saying it, I'll absolutely agree that it is possible, but it, we always get price increases long before that happens, in my experience, in this latest, out of what is called inflation is, is an example of that. So is that enough uh, to get you started here? Absolutely. So th let's, okay. let's jump ahead for a minute. So obviously yeah. a recent article came out from uh, the guardian that showed a bunch of the most profitable companies over the course of the last two years. And they were many of which were claiming they needed to raise prices to offset inflation. And we're talking about, 800% profit, 333% profit increases. These are increases, not just where they were, but actual increases over prior earnings. Yeah. We, the actual salaries of individuals, however, only rose like 1.6% as opposed yeah. to the 800% and 300% yeah. of Amazon and others. Is this not a, a abusive market power? Isn't this the smoky room with the, the writing up and marking up of accounts and, and so forth to maximize ROI or return on investment for those that don't know that word? Right. Well, yes, but, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. 
that's what the law says they're allowed to do. And that's what's supposed to make, uh, you know, capitalism great. And that's supposed to be what's lifted us out of poverty is that uh, when there are large profit margins, it attracts new businesses and then you get competition and brings it down. Now, when that process isn't working, the government is already has the laws in place, the antitrust laws to regulate and supervise and and uh, and make sure these things stay reasonable. If And so what you're talking about at this point could be a failure of government to recognize a non-competitive area where they have an obligation to regulate. Uh, where it's competitive, they're supposed to stay out. Where it's not competitive, they're supposed to regulate. And that's not this is like 1904 or something. I don't know when the Teddy Roosevelt brought in the antitrust laws, but it's been a long time. So, uh, but also, Steve, this has always gone on. Like, when were we reading about these drugs, this company that's buying drugs cheap and then marking the price up 77,000 million percent and selling it. And you see all these poor people can't afford their insulin and things like that. That was long before COVID. Okay. That's oh, been yeah. going on. It's been going on my entire career. So that, that is not, I don't see that as a change. That's, you know, uh, it's, it's certain, you know, that's material for the current inflation discussion. I, sure. you know, and I think the fed, did a study of this, San Francisco or St. Louis or somewhere, and they said that uh, it might be adding three tenths of a percent to the inflation rate. So, look, I'm t- I'm categorically against it. I see it as a failure of government to fulfill its responsibility to regulate when there's insufficient participants to have competitive markets, and it happens all the time. And we see governments that get elected because they pledge to fail to regulate. They cut the number of regulators and they give corporations you know, just handing them these profits because I guess they're getting getting it back through donors or something like that, right? You get this negative feedback loops from business to government. We have that. But I think if we're going to talk about this inflation, I wouldn't scapegoat it going in that direction. Okay, I'll, so, I'll go there for other reasons, but I won't go there for this inflation. Okay, so with that in mind, we yeah. see fuel prices going up absurdly yeah. high. And, yes. you know, I mean, like such a jump that the average person is really, really struggling now. Is this an yeah. issue of a lack of supply or is this price gouging? Okay, it's it's an issue of a single supplier at the margin setting price. who has been setting price since 1973, and that's Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco. And in the last couple of years, it's OPEC plus, if you notice, that's because Russia's involved now. And Russia got involved during COVID when there was a collapse in demand that the Saudis couldn't handle because their production would have gone to zero. And uh, Russia agreed to share the cuts, but, you know, they don't do this for free. And so now they're sitting at the table, you know, with Saudi Arabia and they become their weapon supplier and the whole thing. And, Saudis like them better than they like us because they don't criticize <laughs> them for killing journalists and for bombing Yemen. They, mm-hmm. they think that's they, they support them on all this. So we've lost Saudi Arabia as a strategic ally. And they uh, let me give you the best way to explain this. When I explain this to you, there isn't a single oil analyst in the world that's understood this any more than any member of parliament, member of Congress understood that the sequence, you know, that they were spending first that and then uh, so that taxes could be paid afterwards. Yet, you know, everybody in the central banks and monetary operations knew, knew this. Everybody I've talked to for the last 50 years, there's like no discussion about it. It just goes without saying they can't do a reserve at a drain, which means the uh, economy can't make a payment to the government unless the government makes a payment to the economy first. And they call that a reserve ad because they it's the Federal Reserve Bank and they call the bank accounts that they have, all the banks, reserve accounts, just to confuse everybody. And they say, we right. can't do a reserve drain without doing a reserve ad. We can't debit an account unless we credit it first. You know, so it's What like, is a reserve drain? Just start right it, there, because this it, is a term just, most people have never heard. Yeah, it's a payment that a bank makes that causes the money in its account to go down, like anybody else. When you have a checking account, you write a check, the, the number goes down. That's called a drain on your reserves. <laughs> so, okay. so instead of saying, you know, we're just like reducing their balance in their account, they call it a reserve drain because their accounts and they're at the Federal Reserve. So it's a reserve drain or something. I don't know. It's just a little smoke in front of the, what's going on. So you, it's, just, it's nothing you got, complicated. You got, you got guys yeah. like Ro Khanna running around telling people that we should raise 
taxes on corporations to yeah. offset this inflation. Yeah. Everything I've ever read from Randy Ray and others have been taxes on corporations are a pass through to right. consumers. So let's let's look, look. One of the major impetuses driving this has been energy prices. So let's look at how the energy price goes up, and then tell me what a tax on corporations is going to do to this process. Okay. So right now the demand, and I'll use round numbers, is 100 million barrels a day. That's how much we burn every day around the world. And Saudi production is about 10 million barrels a day, and they export about seven or seven and a half million barrels. They, they use the other three themselves. Okay, so, and but Saudis are capable of producing 12, but they don't. They're only producing 10. And you've heard President Biden say he wants the Saudis to pump more oil. And I'll get back to that in a minute, which is an absurd statement, by the way. <laughs> and I'll show why. And you'll see why in five minutes, three minutes. Okay, so, um, so the, let, let's say the Saudis, let's say the price of oil today is $115 a barrel. And the Saudis set their price at 120, just for a number. Okay, so the rest of the world's producing 90. The Saudis have the last 10, uh, and they're exporting seven and a half. So the world needs seven and a half million barrels from the Saudis every day, or else we have to go shut the lights off. So if the rest of the world's at 115, and they go around trying to buy the oil they need, they need 100 million barrels total burning, then um, the Saudis are using three, so they need 97 more. So <clears throat> they, they're not there. They can only get 90. That's all they're producing. Okay, so they can't get the last 7 million barrels, which means about 3.30 every day, everybody have to shut the lights off and stop driving or something. Okay, because we'd run out of energy every day for a few hours, and you know, because we're only getting 93% of what we need, the other 7% of our time, which is how many hours is that? An hour and a half or something two hours, we'd, right. we'd be dark, right? And so they have to go to the Saudis because we need the oil on a daily basis to burn, okay? And they've got it, and their price is 120 and there's, and there's no market here. It's a single supplier for that last 7 million barrels every single day. And our inventories now are down to a minimum. You can say you could take it out of inventory. Fine, we're already using the strategic petroleum reserve. It's not enough. We still need their last seven because of, you know, Russia's cutting has been cutting back because we're not allowed to buy it. And uh, and so you're going to have to pay 120 to get those last 7 million barrels, period. Well, in the meantime, you're not going to just jump from 115 to 120. As as you get towards your 97 or whatever you're buying for everybody else, uh, 93, you're going to start offering more and more to try and get those last seven. I mean, you don't know it because you read it in the newspaper. You know it because you say, I can't, they say, well, you know, don't have any. Well, I'll pay you 116. I don't have any. I'll pay you 117. I don't have any. 118. Please, I don't want to pay Saudi's 120. 119. <laughs> right? I'll pay you 120. We still don't have it. I don't want to go to the Saudis. I'll pay you 121. We don't have it. Okay, I'll go to the Saudis and pay 120. So now the price, what that does is it drives the price off of all the oil for that day by the end of the day to 120. Now, it's not just one day. There's averages and there's long-term contracts and there's delivery lags of 30 days. There's boats going in and out, loading and unloading. But this is a concept underneath it. And over a day, two days, three days, this is exactly what happens. It just doesn't happen. It's not pure. So, so yeah, go ahead. This is a supply issue, but it's an intentional scarcity where Saudi Arabia, who has a capacity to create yeah. plenty of oil, has chosen to keep supply down to drive the prices up. And no, thus, no, no, no. They've they, okay, here's the point. The Saudis can set any price they want for that last seven million, but they have to set a price. They can't just say we're going to go sell it at the market. There is no such thing. It's like if okay. you're the power company and you have the electricity for the city and you're the only power company, you have to set a price. Okay, down here, our power is 50 cents a kilowatt. It's a lot. The, the, our Water and Power Association, WAPA, WAPA, sets the price. They have a meeting, and at the meeting, they set the price. So they set the price at 50 cents. Now, usage might drop during the month. The price won't fall. You're still going to go to them and pay their 50 cents. Usage might go up, and they might run out of power and have brownouts, but the price won't go up unless the board gets together and meets and raises the price, right? Because it's a single supplier, you know, at the margin, at least, because we have so solar. It's a monopoly. 
monopoly. Yeah, it's a monopoly. Power. Look, we have yeah. solar. We're producing a lot of our own power. But at the margin that we need power from them and their power is needed. It's a monopoly for what? For the portion that's needed. Just like the Saudis have a monopoly for that last seven million. Right? Right. And so they have to set a price. So what price should they set? I don't know. They can't just so they set a price. So let's say they let's say the price of the market was 115 that day, they noticed or from history. And their their price is 115. So then we'd be in balance. How much would they sell? They'd sell the same seven million. They're not going to sell more because they split the price one. The world only needs a hundred that day. Okay. If they raise the price to 120, they're selling the same seven million. If they lower the price to 110. The whole price structure will come down to 110 and they'll sell the same 7 million. It's not going to change. Okay. Because that's all the market needs that day. The demand can't change day to day just because the price changes. Some things the demand does change day to day, but not well. You don't stop driving to work because the price went up 25 cents or a dollar or something like that. You know, in fact, if price has gone up, the last I saw American demand for gasoline has gone up. So it hasn't even gone down with gas going to six dollars a gallon or whatever it is right? people have just been impervious to it for whatever reason maybe more people are getting jobs and have to drive to work right employment's up all right and so so when you're a monopolist like that you can't change the quantity all you can do is set a price and let the market buy what it wants at your price you can't pump more oil or decide to pump more oil you could decide to lower the price and maybe the market will buy more they could lower it to 20. Maybe they'd sell more. You probably would. They could raise the price to 200. Maybe they'd sell less. Probably would. They have to do that. They have to change the price and let the quantity adjust. There's no other way to do it. If you think about it, so you know, this what is, else can it, they do? So Seriously, this is they, a demand-driven, yet at the same time... It's a fixed demand. Okay. And there's fixed supply. And there's excess capacity, but only the Saudi, everybody else just sells everything they have. They say, well, the U.S. has more oil than Saudi Arabia. So we're selling more. Why aren't we the price set? Because we have a thousand different sellers just selling at the best price they can get. Everybody else is just selling at the market, the best price they can get, all they have. Saudis are looking at this saying, I don't want to do that. If I sell my 12 million barrels at the market, I try to do that, just lower the price. It's going to go down to zero or 10 or $20. It went negative not too long ago. Okay, you can't do that doesn't work. They have to set a price or let the whole thing collapse. So they don't like doing this. They'd rather sell all 12 at the good price, but they can't because if they try and sell 102 million barrels into 100 million barrel demand, you've got a downward spiral till somebody stops selling it. And demand will, or t- demand goes up or something. Somebody fills so in is, the price. Is it an unfair ask that we do something to bring the price of this down? Or is this just something right, well, let's we have get to, to the last let's, just do? So look, the president and everybody else, all the analysts are saying, you know, we need we Saudis need to pump more to get the price down. Now, do you see how that's like patently absurd based on the simple dynamics of a you know n- not a, a non-competitive situation? That right? that is an absurdity. They say, oh well, we'll get Venezuela to pump an extra million barrels, then the price will go down. Like, why? That just means when the Saudis set whatever price they set, they're going to sell six instead of seven. They'll have an extra million of excess capacity. It doesn't mean the price will change. We at least unleashed a strategic reserve of half a million or a million barrels a day getting sold. The price didn't change. It went up because the Saudis are raising their price. Now, if we hadn't done that, they would have sold a half a million or a million barrels a day more. Instead of having 2 million excess capacity, they would have only had 1 million if we hadn't done that. But all we did was change their excess capacity. Can you see the market force at work here? You see how it's completely yeah. different from what you thought it was uh, 15 minutes ago? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Seriously. The question becomes, my question becomes this. As I go down the street here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I yeah. see the gas set at 465 a gallon, yeah. I'm not a petroleum producer. I don't create barrels of oil. I don't work in the industry. I'm just a guy that drives a car to get to and from work. I'm a rank and file voter that's looking at the gas prices and saying, what the hell? Why isn't my government doing for me to help me out of this? I can't afford to eat, blah, blah, blah. And then I look out in California and I'm looking at $8 a gallon and I'm saying, what the hell? So obviously there are layers to this wholesale arrangement, to the retail arrangement, et cetera. 
where is the inflation that we're all experiencing at the pump? Really, it's where is up. that generating from? Well, the margins are all is mostly tax. California's all tax. So you have a lot of state taxes. If you look at the actual margin that the gas stations are making, it's not it's not where the problem is. The problem is the underlying price of oil. Now, in, in the UK and across Europe, where they've had much larger taxes, where it's been $10 a gallon for a long time, and where the underlying price was only $2 a gallon for a wholesale price, their increase might be the same $2, but it's only 20% instead of, you know, 100%, right? And so, uh, you know, because it's on a larger base. And, and there are a lot of places in the world where there isn't any tax. And so it's still three and a half dollars, whatever the wholesale price is for gasoline. And the, so the wholesale price is coming from the suppliers and that's doubled, more than doubled. And it's, and, it, and nobody understands where the price is coming from. So nobody's doing anything about that except making idiotic comments like they need to pump more. <laughs> You know, it shows a complete lack of understanding of how the process works. And I just got off exchanges with some of the you know, major size oil traders telling me I'm wrong. So, OK, <laughs> they don't know how it works either. Right. And uh, how many how many Nobel Prize winners told me I was wrong about the monetary sequence? Right? It's the same thing. And that's that's why the debate finally changed between Obama to uh, I was going to say Bush to um, <laughs> Biden. <laughs> Close enough. Yeah, they look a lot yeah, alike, right? Yeah, in right. Terms yeah, of... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Our B, our B, B level presidents, whatever you want to call. Them. But um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and under the last COVID thing, all they talked about was whether this spending would cause inflation. Nobody once thought the checks would bounce. Nobody said, "What happened to Paul Ryan talking about how we're going to be the next Greece?" It's all gone, right? What happened to going to China to check with our bankers about borrowing? What happened to Paul Krugman with his, you know, the, we're going to run up interest rates, you know, with the, the per se by the public. None of that. It's all gone. So and that uh, to that degree, MMT has had an enormous influence and it's changed the debate from um, talking about solvency. We're going to go broke to talking about we might cause inflation. And now we're here talking about are we causing inflation? And I'm telling you, for the most part, no. What we're getting are price increases from a monopolist raising price, not from any kind of a monetary inflation. And we've had this monopolist is blatantly raising price and doing it in a, in a disguised method. They don't just set the price. They set their, set their spreads to benchmarks, which is indirectly doing exactly the same thing, driving the price higher continuously. And it's been trending up for six or eight months now. And it's going to continue to trend up while they have the same pricing structure in place that's a simple price setting mechanism that causes the price to go up, 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 you know, not every day, but week to week, month to month until people stop using it, until it breaks the economy, which is exactly what they did in 2008. I think they got up to 155 or 157 and it broke the economy. Now, there are a lot of other issues that collapse with it that we talk about. Nobody talks about what the price of oil did to the economy back then, uh, but it was, it was same thing. But today on an inflation adjusted basis, 150 is 300, right? That was 12 yeah. years ago, 14 years ago. <clears throat> and so maybe it takes, you know, $300 oil before the, I don't know where the, when the price breaks the economy and causes demand to collapse. It's going to keep going up until the demand collapses. And that's the Russia strategy. This is their extended, you know, war strategy against the world. They're working with the Saudis to make sure they're OSPs, they're called official setting prices, are set at wide enough spreads to benchmark to be above fair value, which causes the spread to the price to just go up and up and up every week. It's, it's a simple case of monopolist setting price in a very thinly disguised manner. Uh, and it's not going to stop until that's addressed, no matter what we do with interest rates, which we're doing backwards, of course. That's the next no matter question. what we do, no matter what we do with taxes, they don't care. They're just going to keep raising the price of oil till it breaks. You know, it's like a kid's breaking his toys, right? He's just going to hammer and hammer and hammer until the thing breaks. And that's what they do. And and <clears throat> there's nobody addressing that, period. And they've got this NOPEC thing where we're going to file a lawsuit against them for having a cartel. You know, this is like a Monty Python thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's file a, a lawsuit against the Romans for, you know, for crucifying people <laughs> against humans. They're violating human rights. It's like, okay. 
let's go to Jerome Powell for a minute. Okay. Jerome Powell is out there talking about how we're going to have to raise interest rates and it's going to be a very, very painful experience. Uh, you know, I talked to Randy Ray the other day who, uh, who written a paper recently saying there is no soft landings coming basically from the Fed jacking up Volcker rates. Can you talk to us about the seventies real quick with the OPEC crisis and, and interest rates and Volcker, and then bring it forward. If you can, it's this, I already did. It's the same thing. Well, that so, I, we, I understand, but I want to tie Volcker into this yeah. if we can do that. Okay. We'll just change the names. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we had, well, we had Arthur Burns and Miller and that, that was when I, you know, I was with my, back when I was your age, you know, in my, like, Early 30s. Back when you're studding around in the Consueler uh, race car, right? By the way, Warren Mosler designed the coolest race car of all time. Check it out. But, Look but, him up. But it was, but it was, uh, it was long before I did that. So uh, this was in, in the. I was born in 1949, so that was when I was yeah. third in 1979, right? I was at William Blair. I went there in 1978, so I was that was in the middle of when I was in the middle of the fray, so to speak. But um, so you've got. The Saudis raising price, and it was cost is cost push inflation is what they called it. The Keynesians didn't know what to do. They had been sort of running things, and everybody was had uh, was doing things uh, counter cyclically, and we were had the golden years of low unemployment and all that kind of thing. And then when the Saudi when when the price of oil switched from the Texas Railroad Commission, who was limiting production of our oil in Texas to make sure the price didn't fall below two and a half dollars a barrel. Uh, and, you know, when it, when it, um, cause we had overcapacity, but as demand picked up, we used up our overcapacity. And so they couldn't do, they couldn't do that anymore. That wasn't the problem anymore. And then the price um, was getting up over $3 and the excess capacity had moved to Saudi Arabia. And now they're the ones setting price. And they had a different agenda than the Texas Railroad Commission. The Texas Railroad Commission had kept the price stable for 14 or 15 years and those were the golden years of economics and everybody talks about what caused the golden years it was the texas railroad commission keeping the price of energy stable for the whole time so it was it was an excess capacity at a stable price you could have all the growth you wanted until they ran out and the excess capacity switched to the middle east and then they had a different agenda to get as much money as they could and they started raising the price and they the price went from three to forty it's 11 times higher in about 10 years, which would be, you know, from going from 50 today to 600 or 700 or something, uh, you know, over the 10 year period of time. And it completely destabilized everything. And it was cost push inflation, they called it. It caused all these through pass throughs, it caused prices to go up in general about that much. And they took all kinds of measures to counter it. And the Keynesians, said the only way you can do this is direct price and wage controls and nobody wanted to do that. So that was the last time we had any kind of counter-cyclical Keynesianism. They just totally discredited themselves. And it was not, it didn't recognize the, you know, the way to go. It was not, it was not a viable policy. It was, you know, not, not a, they deserved to go. In other words, if that was what they were going to propose. And the monetarists came in and started talking about how interest rates could take care of this. Yeah. Like the Saudis even knew what our interest rate was. What do they care? They're just raising prices. <laughs> so the so the price of oil kept going up, and then uh, inflation kept going up, which were price increases, which were caused by the price of oil pushing through and everything. Back then, we used oil itself for a lot of things, and then um, we had President Carter came in, and he started doing things that long term did help. Actually, he uh, uh, deregulated natural gas, for example, which allowed the utilities to switch from oil to natural gas places like. Uh, you know, we had a lot of util public utilities were using burning oil as primary source of generation, power generation, and they couldn't rely on natural gas because most of the wells were capped because there was a limit of two and a half dollars MCF or something. To, or maybe it was 20, 20, 50 cents. I don't know. It's very low. MCF mean a uh, million cubic feet of Thank natural you. gas. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, maybe it was fifty cents or so. It was very. It was too low for them to bother to explore and do it. So their wells were capped. And so even if the power companies wanted to use it, they couldn't count on supply coming at that price. So they just didn't do it. Once it was deregulated and they could drill for as much as they want, they knew we were washing natural gas and they could start switching over to it. So that, that helped. 
But what? We, but there was also a big demand shock in 1979 with the recession. So what happened was, uh, Tall Paul came in. That's Paul Volcker, the guy you were talking about. Remember the Boston Celtics had Small Paul and Tall Paul. They had Paul Silas <laughs> was Tall Paul and Paul West Paul was Small Paul. So then we had Tall Paul as our Fed chairman, deciding to uh, cap you know, borrowed reserves, which is another absurdity. You can't do that. He had no idea how monetary operations work. So all he did was shift in, you know, interest rate determination from the Washington Fed to the New York Fed, who was stuck with this idiotic policy and had to set a rate at some point. And you saw, I remember on a Wednesday, Fed funds at 28 bid, no offered. <laughs> it's like completely stupid. But what happened was the inflation kept going. But an interesting ha thing happens when you, so the higher rates promote inflation, because what do higher rates do? Higher rates are nothing more than the payment of interest from a government's point of view. It's the payment of interest on the government debt, the public debt, the dollars that the government has spent that, hasn't been, that haven't been used to pay taxes and they remain out there until they're used to pay taxes. We know the government spends first. Some of the money gets used to pay taxes. The rest is still sitting there in government accounts, reserve accounts. It sells securities, so some of that money switches to savings accounts, which we call treasury securities, so just savings accounts with the Fed. They'll just sit there forever, and the only way they can disappear is if they're used to pay taxes, which would be, we call a government surplus. The government raises taxes, and people have to use that money to pay. Okay, so the public debt, it's just the money out there. It's $30 trillion now. The, the, the government has spent $30 trillion more than it's taxed. Maybe it's spent $120 trillion. And 90 trillion has been used to pay taxes, so that's gone. The other 30 trillion is still sitting there in Treasury securities and excess reserves with the Fed. And the government pays interest on that money. And that's an interest expense. It's part of the deficit, it's deficit spending. And when it raises rates, it pays more interest. And so as they're raising rates, they're paying more interest. So they were paying a couple of hundred billion, it'll go to 300 billion or 400 billion. And so when they raise rates, it's what I call basic income. It's just income being paid by the government, deficit spending, but only to people who already have money. And, and who are those economy. people that have those money? The rich people, it's right? I mean, well, that by definition, they already have money. Right. You're paying interest to people who only already have money and in proportion to how much they have. So if you have some money, you get interest. If I have twice as much money as you, I get twice as much subsidy from the government. So this is basic income, citizen's income, but only for people who already have money in proportion to how much they have, that the Federal Reserve votes to pay out when they raise rates. And that's the only thing they actually do. They vote, they raise their hands, and they talk, and they write things down. But operationally, the thing that happens is they pay more money out to people who already have money in proportion to how much they have. Now, there are a lot of people in favor of basically- One, one second. That yeah. right there, in yeah. essence, in exacerbates wealth inequality. Let's just, I mean, it's obvious, but that's yeah, what sure. it does. My, yeah, I'm paying people with money more money. Increases yeah, wealth. If you, don't have, if you don't have any savings, you don't get it. This is like a stimulus program, but only for people who already have money in proportion to how much they have. So think of it as a stimulus for, you know, people who already have money in proportion to how much you have. That's what it is. The Fed is paying the stimulus out. And that's supposed to bring down inflation, to pay money to people who already have money in proportion to how much they have. And if it doesn't work, they'll pay more. If it doesn't work, they pay more, okay? I call it like the carpenter with this piece of wood and he's cutting and he says, you know what? No matter how much I cut off, it's still too short. The Fed starts paying interest and the inflation doesn't come down, it goes up. No, they're not, they didn't raise it a lot this time. Volcker raised it a lot and it went up a lot. So they pay more, so they raise it some more. We're not gonna <laughs> stop until this thing breaks, you know? Like the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? <laughs> the old idiotic. British Navy. All right. This is like nuts. But what does happen when you get inflation is you get a money supply shortage. So if you think about this, let's say all prices were to double and you used to give your, you know, go shopping with $300 in your pocket at the store. Okay. Now you have to have $600 in your pocket to go shopping. You need twice as much savings or cash because that's what it is. Okay. Or you need twice as much credit on your credit cards to buy anything, okay? You need, uh, if Apple computer has 250 billion in cash and all the prices and salaries and everything doubled, now its cushion isn't so much anymore. It's been cut in half. Now it needs 500 billion in cash. So what price increases do is create a shortage of net financial assets. The public debt's 30 trillion. That was 100% of GDP. 
If we double GDP because prices double, nothing else happens. Okay, from 30 trillion to 60 trillion, now the public debt's only 50% of GDP. It's not enough equity to support what credit structure is needed to now support $60 trillion of GDP. We've created a money supply shortage. And every inflation creates a money supply shortage. In the Civil War, they printed greenbacks. I'm sure it was because the inflation was creating a money shortage. If you look at Weimar Republic was printing money like crazy, that was because of the money shortage created by the inflation. That isn't what caused the inflation. That was the follow-up to the inflation because people could make change at their cash registers. They didn't have enough money. Okay, because all the cash registers suddenly need twice as much. If you have 100% a month in inflation, you need twice as much every month. Otherwise, you can't run your businesses. The whole economy crashes down from the lack of money to make change, and, you know, just walking around pocket money. Okay, it's just a big fat money shortage. So this happened in 1979. The inflation was 12%. The deficit spending was only 6 or 7 So the public debt, whatever it was back then, was actually shrinking adjusted for inflation in real terms, it was the same as running a budget surplus. It was the same as like a 7% budget surplus. Okay, and the whole economy just collapsed because of that. And they go, oh, see the interest rates. That's what collapsed. Yeah, the economy. it brought down inflation, right? Right, right. It also kept the elephants out of Washington. I think, you know, all, these, all this counterfactual stuff, right? And so, uh, so now this is happening again. We're having price increases. We're getting a money supply shortage. We're seeing it. And we're getting a fiscal contraction at the same time. The president's bragging about how the deficits come down by a trillion and a half. And with the 8% price increase, 8% of 30 trillion is 2.4 trillion. It's like a collapse of net financial assets of 2.4 trillion. And you see that in the debt to GDP ratio coming down. I don't know how far down it is now. I don't, I don't get month to month numbers. But it's probably gone from 125 to 100 or something like that. Pretty big collapse. And you see this after wars all the time. You get a big run up in spending during the wars. Prices go up. Then you get a cutback. So you get, there's a crash in the net financial assets, the real money supply. And you get a contraction of government spending. You get a big post-war recession or depression or something. And, and so we had a big COVID war. We spent all this money. Prices went up because Saudis pushed prices up. I can show you statistically how they it, Right. Very little came from the spending. I'm sure it was less than 1% of the 8% came from the spending. There was some, but it wasn't a lot. And uh, total consumer uh, uh, consumption isn't even up from where it was. If you look at the total, it's still lower than it was. It hasn't caught up. So, um, But it is a real fiscal contraction coming from this post-war, the COVID war, where we spent trillions. And what do we spend it on? Okay, people who had lost their jobs got unemployment compensation. That was the big one. People got stimulus checks. It was largely unemployment compensation. Businesses got unemployment compensation. So nobody got more, like, more money than they would normally have. They just got paid to stay home instead of to produce mostly services like restaurants and movie theaters, and subway rides and things like that. The good side slumped, but it came back pretty quickly. And, uh, and yes they had more excess savings, their savings went up. But the form that the excess savings took was reduced consumer debt. So they their credit card balances went down and then they came back up at a slower pace. And they're below where they would have been without all the stimulus. So you can see most of the stimulus money went, the excess stimulus money, if you want to call it, I don't even call it stimulus money, crazy term, but you know, some bought things, but the rest, uh, went to low, uh, turned into lower debt burdens. So we, the consumer now has lower debt burdens than it had before. And so, yes, it has, there's pent up capacity to spend, but from debt. So people have room on their credit cards to spend, but they don't have more money in their bank accounts to spend. There's no money burning a hole in their pocket. There's credit card debt ready to go at 18% interest if you really want to do that. Nobody right. really wants to do that anyway. And you're starting to see it happen now only because suddenly fiscal spending is down and the transfer payments are down. And so in the price, yeah, I think Biden came out and said that he's celebrating this 1.3 trillion in deficit reduction. Here we go. Yeah, right. Yeah, it sounds yeah, yeah, a lot right. like brother Bill right. Clinton and prices are up. You got to pay more for gas. So when you pay on your credit card, you, that's up. And if you can't pay it, it's 18%. So we're doing that because prices went up because of this, not because, you know, we're partying for the good times. Or anything well, like that. well, if prices go up, you yeah. know, 
by percentage, taxes go up, whether it be sales tax or whatever. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. now government receipts at the federal level go up. And we know that government taxation equals dollar deletion or destruction, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So this is creating the grounds for that surplus. Yes. And, and with private debt. Yeah, that happens every cycle. And so what it is, is the counter cyclical automatic stabilizers. The automatic stabilizers, the fact that taxes go up when the economy grows disproportionately, cause the deficits to come down and ends the cycle. Okay, they're they're far too aggressive. They're gonna they end any cycle. And all these people say, oh, we need more counter cyclical. So we have too many already. They've ended every recovery. They've cut it short, cut it on its knees. And there's some people say, oh, that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. If you lose real output, that's the worst possible thing. There are other things you can do if they're creating some kind of other problem. You can regulate lending or something, but you don't have to cut the knees out and put people out of work. So um, anyway, so this inflation, if you want to, what's happened is inflation used to be something else. It used to be the continuous increase in prices. It was a monetary phenomenon. It was on the gold standard because your reserves would double or something like that. And so now there was, and the economy was always reserve constrained. So this would allow the economy to expand and recreate. You know, it would be created, you know, it would inflate because prices were always relative to your reserves. And I don't want to go into that, but we don't have that anymore. All right. So, uh, <laughs> um, but this is not one of those monetary inflations at all. There's not any element about it. You know, um, there are people who, the, I shouldn't say there's not any element. The Fed studies have shown that maybe 0.3% can be attributed to that. But we get, you know, one and a half or two percent inflation anyway. And so it, it hasn't like added to that. All right. That we were going to get anyway. Yes, we have isolated maybe maybe more so than before areas of price gouging because we've had more consolidation because of COVID. We've got uh, supply uh, considerations have changed. So there might be fewer suppliers of the same thing. So they have more market power. Fine. But that's all the realm of antitrust law, and that's what government's supposed to be doing on the antitrust side. And the fact that we've eliminated that department's budget is not an inflation problem. That's a regulation problem. So we've got two final questions, and maybe we can yeah. bundle them into one as we're winding up here. Number okay. one is obviously when those interest rates go up and the payouts to the wealthy go up, they yeah. end up inflating a lot of assets like housing. Housing is one of the things that you see going up exponentially and yeah. you see a lot of things getting crushed personal experience noted with these interest rates going up now as well but you see places like blackrock buying up mobile home parks you see uh cities and states writing up laws to prevent cohabitation from sharing rent even there, there's literally a huge asset bubble at least that's the way it feels anyway that these prices are rising exponentially how does this how you're Joe Biden. God forbid. I, I, I feel bad for you if you're Joe Biden, but you're Joe Biden in this scenario here. And you have to you have to fix this re-elections coming up. The Democrats are getting ready to take a major bloodbath in this next election as the re re-return of Trump after watching fecklessness from the Democratic Party show its head. All of a sudden, the resurgence of the uh, far right fascists is about to take place. you got to try and save the party. How do you fix the economy, Warren? <laughs> you know, am I supposed to like do this for free? <laughs> no, no, no. Trust me, Biden's Biden's getting so much money to do this. I'm sure through his Ukrainian connections that you know he's. No, well, anyway. I, I, yeah, I, I, know, I know. I know. <laughs> give, give me the high level. Give me the high level. How how do we fix this? Well, you know, we have to identify like what the problem is. So let's say the problem is that we have a bad crop and all the corn corn crop died. We only have half as much. So the price doubled. And now people, you know, it's too expensive. And so people can only eat half as much corn at this price. They don't have enough money to afford it. That did not used to be called inflation. That did not used to be something you'd blame Biden on, you know, that the corn crop died and now it's expensive. How are we going to make it affordable again? Because look, what are you going to do if you give everybody enough money to be able to buy corn at the higher price? They're not going to get twice as much corn. They're just going to drive the price up higher so they because there's only half as much corn right if you take everybody's money away so then now the price of corn comes down because they 
only half the people can afford it because you've taken everybody else's money away. Okay, you've got the price of corn down, but only half the people are going to eat the corn, right? So when you have scarce resources, the market's allocating by price, you don't have that, you know, that's not an inflation problem, right? And so uh, that kind of a problem has to be addressed either by uh, people just eat less corn and start eating other things. And it's just more expensive to live. Your real standard of living is down because there's been this failure on the uh, output side. You don't have the capacity to keep everybody's lifestyle as high as you have it before because of this supply side failure. And we've had a little bit of that. We've had quite a bit. Part of it was self-induced from the tariffs, of course. Uh, Trump put, President Trump, 17% tariff on lumber because Canada wasn't charging us enough. What kind of idiot policy is that? So what does Biden yeah. do? He doubles down on it. So it's now 34% <laughs> because they're still not charging us enough. It's like, Donald who are Biden. these guys? Who are these guys? You know? And so, New MAGA. You know, if you need to send somebody out shopping for you, don't send either one of them. <laughs> they go out and punish people for not charging them enough. So uh, they can't come up with another solution other than to punish them and try and force them to raise prices when we're out shopping in the world. What's the matter with you? So, uh, <laughs> and I understand all the ramifications, but that's not how you address them. That's like the worst possible way. And then they say, oh, well, lumber prices are up. So we have this inflation. So now we got to take everybody's money away. Wait a minute, <laughs> you know, raise taxes or something or raise rates, which is backwards, <laughs> but they got the gun backwards as they shoot themselves in the face. But, um, you know, look, the policy was to raise prices. Now you're asking me, what can we do to bring them down? Well, get rid of the tariffs, you know, until you've got a policy. Is your policy higher prices or lower prices? Is your policy higher prices or better for America or lower prices? You, you got to give me a consistent policy, President Biden, before I can tell you how to fix it. You know, what's you have to tell me what's broken in a way that makes sense. You know, uh, well, prices are too high. Well, fine. Remove your policies and raise it. Remove all the state taxes on gasoline if you don't want the price so high. That'll cut the price probably $2 a gallon everywhere. The wholesale price is three and a half. It doesn't need to be any higher than that. Uh, well, yeah, but we want the higher price so that people will use less <laughs> because of, a, you know, we want, you know, uh, we're worried about climate change. The environment. Great. Yeah, we're worried about the environment. Well, so am I. Great. So then why do you want prices lower? Well, because we want to bring inflation down. But you want, well, what about the environment? Well, yeah, we want to keep prices up to protect the environment. Come on. <laughs> so when you ask me what advice to give these guys, you know, they're so inconsistent in their responses to anything. Right, yeah. You can't, you can't give them any advice that's not going to, that's going to work for them. That, you know, because they don't have, they don't have a consistent agenda. So it's not, it's not an applicable question to their agenda. Their agenda is, is contradictory to the core. Okay. So <laughs> the, the agenda is a core contradiction and you say, okay, how do we fix it? All right, let's, let's get a, let's get a uh, consistent, you know, agenda. That's not contradictory. And, and then we can give you some ideas. L let me just close this. Uh, out. I'll tell you what, asking the Saudis to pump more isn't going to help anything. R exactly. Well, well, hold on. So let and me, Venezuela I'm pumping oil. more oil, giving Chevron the rights to get oil from Venezuela is not going to help. What I heard you say, though, during this yeah. is that we have a supply issue, that we our supply chains are really what's causing the bulk of this is what I'm Well, that's what's yeah. caused this one time adjustment. Okay, and sure. Part of okay. it is self part of it is self imposed by the, the tariffs that started the disruption. OK. And then it, with it continued that in, with lockdowns, lockdowns and everything else. Yeah. So if you were to take a fiscal approach to this. Would you invest instead in the supply chains that are part of the national infrastructure, which would have, have a much longer lead time? I don't know how many shovel ready, uh, you know, jobs yeah. would be there to impact anything. But what what might that be? I mean, it, it sounds to me like an investment in infrastructure is the best way the government can respond and lower tariffs. Uh, you know, obviously, states have the dilemma of trying to find revenues wherever they can find them, which is why they raise taxes on gas because they are required. They have to have tax revenues to right, be but the federal revenue. government could replace that. I agree, a hundred percent, thousand per trillion percent. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So and they could do it on a blanket basis, like we'll replace all the states equally, whether you already have a tax or not. 
and so unfunded mandates. Yeah. So, well, that won't change the gasoline price. See, yeah. that's what I'm saying. A consistent agenda. All right. right. So we could we could say, all right, fine, what you said, but how do you, there's not a consistent agenda for this for infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure do you want? More oil drilling? I don't think so. Well, maybe we Green do. Energy. Maybe we don't. Yeah. Okay. Well, what does that even mean? Right. I when we look, look at that. when we look at all the dirt that goes into producing electric cars, you know, you know, what's yeah, the break even time? Of, you know, do we really want to do that? You know, uh, we nobody's look, got a consistent agenda on what clean energy is. It's a, just a slogan right now. And look, we just when we went into COVID lockdowns <clears throat> within a week, our emissions dropped fifty percent. Okay, wow. across the board, roughly. Okay, it's the first time you can see China from space. <laughs> no, <laughs> I okay, remember nobody, that you. <laughs> nobody ever seen it. Okay, so, <laughs> and and and, um, and we did it by eliminating non-essentials. Nobody starved to death. You know, nobody went naked from lack of clothing. Nobody had any lack of real, you know, material. Except goods. for the people that were already like that, right? Right, 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 right. No, nobody, nobody. Uh, no new ones. Yeah, it was we none of, you know, we didn't um, give up any uh, essentials. All right, and emissions were down fifty percent. We had just uh, solved our emission problems times a thousand because we're trying to get a one or two percent drop in thirty years or something. We just dropped fifty percent overnight. Okay, uh, on conservation, a hundred percent on conservation. We still had our computers. We still had all our toys. We, you know, we could we had more to go, easily. Okay, we're not, we weren't limiting electricity consumption or anything, right? And we we hadn't shifted or anything. And so, uh, and so, what did we do? Okay, we said, well, we we've got to like restore the economy. We've got to restore growth. Did anybody say, you know what? We just got this jump on emissions. We've just literally saved the planet for humanity. We no longer have a problem of temperature increasing past one and a half percent. In fact, it may start reversing at these levels because this is something unseen in like 50 years. We turn the clock back. Why don't we bring this thing back with things that don't make this environmental problem worse? If it's going to make it worse. Let's just not do it. Okay. Let's, was there any discussion of that whatsoever? No. The discussion was 100% on we got to get GDP back. We got to get people back to work. We gotta, and a year later, we're reopening and everybody's cheering because now GDP has improved the most on record, you know, 15% because we dropped 20 or something. <clears throat> you know, if you drop 20%, you've got to go up a lot more than 20 to get back to where you started. That's just how percentages work. But we're, we're, we're applauding that we got back and emissions are back before to where they were. We just last week announced record gasoline consumption for U.S. drivers and everybody's saying congratulations. We're now we fully recovered. It's like, all right, well, where's some, then they asked me, what are we going to do about the clean energy? What are we going to do about the environment? It's like, what do you want to do about it? So, you know, I tell the story about the Boy Scouts who came home and the scoutmaster said, well, what was your good deed for today? What did you all little boys do? They said, well, five of us helped this old lady cross the street. He says, well, why did it take five of you? He says, well, because she didn't want to go. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, th does, does this economy, does this, is there any political will of consequence to not none so why are we Zero. even talking about it Zero. why is it part of the agenda and here comes my uh, buddy barry armstrong oops the door's locked hey barry i got it just wrapping up my so, radio just give it one oh, second hey, colin you're gonna have to cut this part okay brother this is steve from yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I, I got the I got this point, and and what I want to say is point blank. This is the final word, Warren. Simple letter grade A through F. What do you give Biden and Jerome Powell's grade? They're they're your students. You got to pass or fail. Where what do you give them for handling this situation? Where where, where do they fit? A B C D E or F. For handling it. I, you know, again, it depends on what rhetoric, agenda, whatever. I mean, just in it general, depends, like, it depends on what the agenda is. I, I you know, I, you know, it, it's 
you know, they're serving some agenda for some people. And I'm sure those people think they've done a great job and you know, other people think they have it and they have an election. So they're running a popularity contest. So I guess you go by the polls. You wouldn't go by what I give. Well, the polls say that Biden is losing big time. Nobody well, likes Joe Biden right now. Well, there, there you go. You go. <laughs> All right. Well, Warren, thank you so much for joining me today. This was another episode of Let's Get Ready to Grumble. And folks, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learned something of Warren as always. Thank you for being gracious with your time. I really appreciate it. Tell folks where they can find more information about you, sir. Oh, uh, was it at WB Mosler on Twitter is where I'm most active now because I can say things very briefly. I like that, you know, two sentences and get it out there without going any more than that. And uh, we're, uh, Mo it's uh, MoslerEconomics.com is my website where you can find uh, links to my uh, book, The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, which is free online. And uh, it takes you about half an hour to read and it's written in non-technical terms that uh, even a central banker could understand. And so, uh, along with all the other writings about interest rates and uh, anything else you might want to know. And uh, you can message me on Twitter also if you have direct questions. Awesome. Warren, thank you so much once again for joining me today. Again, folks, this was Steve Grumble and Warren Mosler. And let's get ready to grumble! <laughs> and still, Steve!